Hello comrades and welcome to day five of the founding conference of the Revolutionary Communist International. Now this session is on uh, so-called right populism and how to fight it. There's a lot of discussion at the moment about uh, populism. Ursula von der Leyen recently after the uh, European elections was warning about the growth of the so-called extreme right and extreme left. We have uh, Meloni in Italy, Trump in the US, AFD in Germany. And there are worries uh, amongst some people about the growth of what they describe as fascism. But we as communists, we need to understand what is causing this phenomenon and how do we fight it. Now today we've got uh, Yola Kipchak, who will answer this question. She is a leading member of the Revolutionary Communist International in Austria. Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, as uh, Jack has already said, in the last years and months uh, we've seen in many countries around the world how right-wing so-called populist parties and politicians are gaining support. In, in polls, uh, and also winning some important elections. Uh, in the US, the most powerful country in the world, uh, Donald J. Trump is very likely to win a second term as, pr as a president this, uh, this November. In uh, Argentina, Javier Milei became president last year. Uh, he's this outlandish figure that calls himself an anarcho-capitalist. And, and he was carrying a literal chainsaw during his election campaign <clears throat> as a symbol of how he wants to massacre the public sector. <laughs> and last week, uh, the elections to the European Parliament took place, where right-wing parties together now make up the second largest bloc in the EU Parliament, um, put together because they're also divided <laughs> in two blocs. <laughs> Uh, but the, bomb, the true bombshell uh, was that because of the EU elections, uh, France's president has now called for snap elections. Mac Macron's party was completely defeated with a landslide victory for the far-right party of Marine Le Pen. And, uh, and with, this defeat of, uh, with this defeat, Macron dissolved the National Assembly on the same day. And on the uh, 30th of June and uh, after, there, there will be legislative elections in France now. Uh, in Germany, the Alternative for Germany, or AFD, is gaining in all the polls. Uh, it's a party where, whose main EU candidate recently said in an interview, uh, not everyone in the Nazi SS was a criminal. And, then, and the AFD is probably the most unhinged of all these right-wing parties in Europe. With lots of internal struggles <clears throat> and, and the least control over their own apparatus and members. And in, th in three important regional state elections this fall or this year, they, they will likely come in first place, which will create a big political crisis and undermine the already extremely unpopular so called progressive government made up of the Social Democrats, the Greens, and the Liberals. <clears throat> and there, but there's also Giorgia Meloni, who is it, uh, Italy's prime minister since 2022. She's the leader of the Brothers of Italy that has its um, roots uh, in, the, in the fascist camp after Mussolini. There's also Viktor Orban, who is still uh, running uh, Hungary. The Islamophobe Gerd Wilders won the elections in the Netherlands last November. There, there are gains of right-wing parties amongst others in Spain with Vox, in Portugal with Chega, in Belgium with Vlaams Belang, and in Austria where the Freedom Party will most likely come in first in the general election this, year, uh, this fall, very likely. <laughs> so we can really see how the political center is uh, really melting away around the world. <clears throat> and in this deep crisis of capitalism, there is a deep discontent and anger developing. And, and right-wing parties is an, in a number of countries, though by far not everywhere, um, are, are gaining from this. And, and there are many young workers and youth who are extremely worried about this phenomenon. So they, they hate the racist, anti-immigration, anti-LGBT, <clears throat> and the misogynist agenda of these right-wing parties. 
And then some are even worried that they, we might be on a slippery slope towards fascism. And, and then they're, they're encouraged by all kinds of left-wing groups that warn of the threat of fascism whenever a right-wing party wins elections. Um, we as Marxists, of course, re completely reject these reactionary bourgeois politicians and parties. And we want to defeat them. <clears throat> But for that, uh, we must need we need to understand where the, these successes of the right come from. We have to have a clear class analysis of what's happening. Yeah. We have to look at these uh, phenomena with a sense of proportion, in order to give a correct, a communist perfect perspective of how to fight the right. I say communist perspective because the bourgeoisie is also the ruling class is complaining about the right wing and even try to to fight them a bit. There are millions of articles and papers against the right of right-wing populism, as they call it. But, but the reason why the ruling class doesn't particularly like these so-called populists is not the same as ours. Uh, they don't like them because they see them as a danger to the stability of their capitalist system. Populism is not a Marxist term. It's a bourgeois term with no class analysis behind it. It, it's a bourgeois, it's, it's, it's a concept that, that looks at parties and political phenomena uh, simply from the point of view of what's good for bourgeois stability. And, and that's why the bourgeois so-called political scientists uh, also have no clear definition of what this populism is actually precisely. <clears throat> they, they will take more or less random superficial characteristics, like they put the people against the elite, or they deny climate change. And then they would look at these politicians with a sort of checklist, which is a very empiricist method and approach that only sees phenomena in isolation and doesn't have an insight into the deeper processes that are happening. They have no class analysis and no dialectical understanding of society, as Marxists do. And, and this is why they lump together as populism completely qualitatively different phenomena. From, from Hitler's fascism to Le Pen, and then even left reformists like left Jeremy Corbyn or Podemos or Bernie Sanders, that they then call left populist. And this is also the, the same mistake that the left sectarians often make, where they try to fit a phenomena in a checklist of like, this is a, these are the fascist characteristics. And, and they, they, they put like a scheme on the, on the real world, uh, which is why when they see a victory of a right-wing party, something with the media, it's like, ah, fascism, which, which confuses honest uh, yeah, young people and workers who, who want to understand this phenomenon. <clears throat> And this is uh, completely unscientific and veils the real state of things in, instead of explaining them. So which is uh, why we have to look at the fundamental processes that are taking place in society. We have to uncover the class relations in society and how they change. And then we will also be able to interpret and understand uh, like uh, uh, superficial or like phenomena on the sur surface, such as election results or parties becoming popular. And we have to look concretely how the relations between the classes develop in each uh, country, what this does to the regimes, the parties, and the, and the state. Like Trump is not quite the same as Orban in, in Hungary. A, the AFD is not quite the same as Vox in Spain. And as Trotsky said in a similar, like in a, in a, in a very turbulent period of, period of the 30s, he said in a period of acute social conflict, of, of rapid political shift, of abrupt changes in the, uh, uh, in the situations, Political conceptions and generalizations are rapidly used up, and, and the truth is always concrete. But still, having said that, all these right-wing demagogues are part of the same process, and there are similarities that we can draw out. But for that, we have to understand the deep, profound, objective processes uh, and the deep crisis of capitalism that lies behind it. Any, any class society is uh, built on a fundamental contradiction. A minority, a minority in society, the ruling class, oppresses the majority, but it needs to make the majority accept this fact. And in bourgeois democracy, the, the ruling class even relies on the oppressed a majority voting for their oppressors. So as Lenin phrased it, every few years, we get to vote uh, which members of the ruling class is to repress and crush the people through parliament. And the ruling class has developed a very intricate mechanism of how to make the majority accept their exploitation, keeping the illusion of equality, um, of free elections where it can actually change something, seemingly neutral institutions like the courts, 
the ideological pillars like the media and the school. But fundamentally, the, the stability of class rule relies on the material stability of uh, society. The masses have to have the feeling that life is going okay. Uh, maybe it's even improving a bit. And, and for decades, this was the case in many, many countries around the world. Capitalism was stable, more or less. There was stability, uh, some growth, and the ruling class even was able to give some concessions to the workers, to appease them, but not anymore. Capitalism is in, in an organic, deep crisis, and especially since the crisis of 2008. The working class has experienced one shock after the other. So, uh, everyone sees this extreme rise in inequality. There are attacks on the living standards, falling wages and inflation, but, but really everything around us is just rotting away. They see these extremely bloody wars, such as in Gaza, the, the, the biggest war in Europe uh, since World War in, in Ukraine. There was the pandemic uh, keeping school students locked for two years at home, the climate catastrophe, and the working class in Europe sees that life is not getting better, it's not doing okay, but on the contrary, it's getting worse. And, and there's huge anger and discontent that is growing in the hearts of millions of people. So instead of reforms and concessions, we see cuts and austerity. And in this deep crisis, the, the screws of this intricate mechanism of bourgeois democracy get loosened one after the other. The, the safety mechanis mechanisms of class rule are becoming less and less effective. Ordinary people begin to question the system they live in. They, be be they begin to question all their beliefs they have grown up with, all the ideals they learn in school. And in short, the crisis of capitalism is also the crisis of democracy. Fundamentally, the crisis of democracy is the process in which the oppressed classes start seeing through the conditions that enslave them. And when the means to keep them down don't work as in the past. And, and, and these are actually perfect conditions for class struggle, right? To take the accumulated anger and f against capitalism. And, if, and actually, this is also what is happening. There is only the rise of the right wing, we see. After the crisis of 2008, after the initial shock especially, workers and youth were on their way out. Class further increased. We saw big strike movements increase. I don't know, 40, 48 general strikes or something in the, in the period um, in the uh, uh, two tens. And aware the workers and youth received a chance of change. A reasonable alternative seemed uh, like a way forward. They flushed up new left parties and leaders uh, to the top. We saw the rise of Podemos in Spain, in, of, of Syriza in Greece, of Jeremy Corbyn in, in Britain, of Mélenchon in France, uh, Sanders in the US, and so on. But these uh, reformists were not willing to break with capitalism. They were not willing to even take a, a decisive offense against the capitalists. Sometimes they gave even up before anything could happen, like uh, Corbyn. <laughs> So instead of profit, went to the pressure. And, and they betrayed all of these movements and this mood of enthusiasm. And I'm here I'm ta just talking about the left or lefty reformists that, that started somewhat of a fight uh, in, in, a, in a way <laughs> and then capitulated. But the right reformists don't even do that. That the current German chancellor, Olaf Scholz, he's a sh social democrat. Who, who always complains about the, the right-wing AFD, huh? aren't they racist and bad? But he made all the headlines last December when he demanded big-time deportations of migrants. <laughs> and he, his government fully supports the war in Ukraine, as well as the genocide in Pakistan. And this social democrat is now pushing for the biggest militarization of Germany since the Second World War while implementing cuts uh, for the masses. And on the industrial front as well. If the trade union leaders actually gave a perspective to fight back against the attacks, for higher wages and against mass sackings, uh, where they happen, in some countries they do right now, 
They, they could cut through all the racist right-wing demagogy. Instead, uh, these trade union leaders, they only offer up one crappy deal after the other. So these reformists inspire no confidence and they create no enthusiasm whatsoever. And this is this huge vacuum that leaves room for the right-wing demagogues to rise. There would be no Trump without the betrayal of the Sanders. The complete of the social There would be no Millet without his predecessors. Uh, that, that buckled under the pressures of the IMF loans. And so on. So actually, uh, we, we can say that the reformists ca carry the largest responsibility for the rise of the right wing. And that's, therefore we should not make the mistake to think that this is like a deep-seated right wing turn amongst the workers, like a deep process. And we shouldn't mimic the sectarians and the petty bourgeois lefts. That, that all the workers are a lost case. That they're all forever racists and reactionaries now. This is wrong. In a way, the successes of right-wing demagogues are a distorted reflection of the anger and radicalization that is taking place. So some workers in this situation are already drawing the conclusion from, from the failures of left, left reformism and the crisis. And, and getting more radicalized to the left, they're becoming communists. But that is still a minority. The majority of the working class is still testing out, desperately looking for an answer or a solution. And in absence of a believable working class alternative, this also includes high abstentions in many elections or voting right-wing parties, often just as a protest vote against all the established parties. Because uh, the, the right-wing demagogues, they claim to fight against the elite, of, of kicking them all out. Trump's uh, electoral campaign. Our populist movement to make America great again, against the failed establishment. And, and uh, the, one of the in Austria is, we together against the system. Really problems in society. The Austrian Freedom Party is the only party criticizing the Ukraine war, linking it to the high energy costs. He's a fantastic orator. And his favorite uh, philosopher is actually Hegel. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and these right wingers, uh, they, they even often um, raise some social, like pro working class demands, as le especially so long as they are in opposition and don't have to deliver. Like Marine Le Pen uh, promises an increase of small pensions, uh, a wage rise for healthcare workers and teachers, and 100,000 new social housing uni units per year. I, I would vote for that. Yeah, um, and, uh, but, but of course they, they combine these with racist anti-migrant demands, such as jobs for our own people, no access to benefits unless you have citizenship, and stuff like that. But putting the blame non, not on the capitalists, but firmly on the doubly and triply oppressed minority society. And this is of course completely reactionary, because it divides the working class. Uh, and this is the reason why we as communists oppose these reactionaries. We, we don't have a moralistic um, uh, uh, approach to them, like it's my duty as an anti-fascist to hate them. Our reason for fighting the right-wing demagogues is because they are precisely not fighting against the elites. On, on the contrary, they want, they want to become part of the elite. The only white way to fight against the actual elite, white, the, the capitalist class, is through a united class struggle. But the right-wing demagogues are constantly dividing the working class, spewing racism, homophobia, scapegoating migrants for all problems in society, distracting from the real of problems. And while they demagogically appeal to like individual workers to vote for them, they're anti-trade unions and rabid anti-communists. 
So uh, our slogan must be, if you want better living conditions, if you want to solve your problems, don't kick out migrants, kick out the capitalists. But um, as the capitalist crisis is not solved, the crisis of democracy also deepens. The ruling class is not able to rule as in the past, and, and splits open up within the ruling class. The rule becomes more erratic. And ever, whenever the ruling class tries to make capitalism stable again, uh, they're actually making it more unstable. All the things the liberals are criticizing about the right wing are actually things they are doing themselves in one way or another. So in other words, the right-wing demagogues are actually the spawn of these uh, reasonable politics of the center, They're the product of it. They are the result of the failure of center politics and the status quo. But um, I said uh, populism is not a Marxist term, but we should try to understand this phenomenon a bit uh, better. So the, um, the, the ruling class don't like them, they are afraid of them, because these right-wingers play, a ru uh, play with the huge polarization in society. Th this is playing with fire. They fear that this could rouse the masses, either in support of them, such as the storm of the capital in 2021, when, when Trump supporters broke into the Congress building, but also against them. I mean, the, the ruthlessness of Millet's attacks in Argentina has created a huge counter-reaction including general strikes and, and steering the masses into action. So this kind of activity of the masses is something the ruling class wants to avoid at all costs. But if we, if we look around the world, all these supposedly reasonable center politicians are also enraging the masses all the time. Just look at this genocide in Gaza, supported by all mainstream parties. Macron has provoked several mass movements, <laughs> most prominently the Yellow Vests in 2018, and the strikes against the pension counter-reform. In the crisis of capitalism, the ruling class is forced to attack the working class in order to save the profits. And these attacks will only become harsher in the next period. And it will produce mass anger, the same thing they warned about the right wing. <laughs> the ruling class also doesn't like the right wing demagogues because they're often political outsiders. They're untested. They're not part of the political clique, groomed and honed to the system or even worse, they try to get into the system and try to snack away like uh, positions and jobs from the old cliques. <laughs> with, with, they, they have uh, unpo unpredictable political stances that don't always align with the interests of finance capital. Uh, because uh, they're not so tightly bound to this, uh, to this uh, intricate network of those. So the ruling class fears that they will be harder to control. <laughs> I mean, we just have to think um, uh, how the Republicans in the US tried to find a Trumpism without Trump candidate. A person that would do, would do the exact same uh, politi politics in the public, <laughs> but was from their inner circle. But uh, the problem is that parties do have to win elections. And the center politics is hated by more and more people. The same old faces are hated by more and more people. <coughs> and then there's a general tendency of politicians becoming more demagog demagogic. Trying to win over voters. In the UK and the US, uh, big finance capital has in effect lost control over the most uh, important like traditional parties. <laughs> well, in the US they have two of those, but... But the, 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 it was the Tories that led Britain into, into Brexit. And they have chosen one incompetent leader after the other th since. 
So the capitalists watch with horror that their own personnel is getting more incompetent and unpredictable by the day. So, so demagogic, uh, reckless politicians are not an accidental feature of this epoch. They are the result of democracy in crisis. But particularly in the EU. Uh, the different nation states are already completely um, divided, basically. Because the different bourgeoisies and nation states all have uh, diverging interests. <coughs> and now the ruling class is worried that uh, nationalistic right-wing parties will create even more of a political deadlock in the EU. They want to especially ensure that everyone follows a 100% anti-Russian line, which parties like the AFD or Viktor Orban are not doing. Um, but Meloni is uh, doing it. <laughs> Which, which is now why she's not longer a right-wing extremist or populist in their eyes. <laughs> she, she's, far, she's very reasonable. So um, the, the Austrian president, actually, Alexander van der Bellen, has said that we really have to re-evaluate evaluate whether she's post-fascist. <laughs> because after all, she's pro-EU. <laughs> but these kind of nationalistic politics in the EU are not a speciality of the right wings exactly. <laughs> They're rooted in the fierce capitalist competi competition between the nation states in the EU. And these splits will deepen in the future no matter what, which party rules in, in the different countries in the end. <clears throat> so um, another thing that the, the ruling class doesn't appreciate about these anti-establishment demagogues is that they treat conventions, traditions, and institutions with contempt. Thus undermining their credibility. I mean, Trump has openly raged against the fake news media. And, and he openly contested election results. <laughs> but in trying to combat this uh, right wing, the ruling class with the mainstream parties, the media, and their institutions are doing the exactly same thing. They shamelessly use the media for their propaganda. And they also use the judiciary throwing lawsuits against these populists. Trump faces, I believe, uh, 57 felony charges <coughs> and, and, and at least uh, four big, big federal trials coming up. He was recently convicted of 34 charges uh, in a case about paying hush money to a porn actress, which makes him the first former American president convicted for a crime and the first convicted felon who will likely become president again in November. But this truly astonishing thing is that no other of these criminals has ever been convicted, right? <laughs> so this is completely unprecedented, though. The, the ruling class is weaponizing the state apparatus to sort out the fights amongst each other, completely laying bare the true character of these institutions to millions of, the, of eyes. <coughs> I, mean, I mean, in Germany, they have started investigating the AFD for bribery from Russia and China. 
And they conveniently also found an actual Chinese spy in the staff of one of them. <laughs> and at, um, at, at the beginning of the year, all the mainstream parties, including the reformists, the trade unions, the bosses federation, even the churches, they have tried to really organize rallies against the AFD to save democracy. And at the same time, they're discussing whether there's some legal way to outlaw the AFD. So with these rallies, they have just openly shown their hypocrisy. They really hope to create a big national unity and enthusiasm for their own parties. And the first demonstrations were quite big. But this national unity immediately broke down. On the question of Palestine. And these demonstrations were, became very small very quickly. Um, so to the ruling classes this May, this May, th their plans to bring back center politics <coughs> and to damage the popularity of the right is completely failing. On the contrary, with their methods, they only further destabilize their own system and actually strengthen the right wing. I mean, after Donald Trump's conviction, he immediately went out, proclaimed himself a political prisoner, and his campaign shattered its own fundraising record on the next day. With almost $35 million raised, with many small donations of normal people, and similarly the Pen, the Freedom Party in Austria, the AFD, they're not defeated at all. Instead, we see how all the democratic institutions, the courts, the parties, the media, they're all losing trust. In the US in, in 2023, only 27% have confidence in the Supreme Court. And really, of all the institutions they asked, Congress enjoys an amazing 8% of confidence. It's, it's right at the bottom of all of these institutions. These are amazing numbers. Uh, numbers like this can, pre -rep can be replica replicated in, in most countries um, in a similar trend, even though it's not as low as in the US everywhere. <clears throat> so this shows how the crisis of democracy is deepening, how the political center is melting away, how polarization and anger are growing, and the consciousness of the masses is shaped by constant shocks and blows, which is preparing under the surface huge exposure, explosions of class struggles in the future, which is a very good uh, thing from our point of view. But we have to draw very clear conclusions from all what I've said. First, the bourgeoisie and all their liberal and reformist supporters are incapable of fighting against the right. On the contrary, they are strengthening them with their actions. And secondly, we have to draw a clear line of demarcation between the liberals and us. Because their reasons for claiming to be against the right are not the same as ours. They fight the right to keep the working class oppressed and quiet and peaceful. But we fight the right to strengthen and activate the working class. They fight the right because it is uh, dividing their own bourgeois ranks. And we don't mind at all if the capitalists are fighting amongst each other. But we fight the right because they're dividing the working class. The liberals want to save capitalism, to go back to old times, which is impossible and a complete utopia. But we, we fight the right will, we, we, with class struggle. We, we fight the root of what makes them rise in the first place which is capitalism, and we want to go forward to the future, to socialism. Now, because of the successes of the right wing, there are many honest young workers and youth who are worried that this means we're heading in the direction of fascism. And so it's important to say that this is not what's happening here. 
Fascism is a specific form of capitalist rule. It's the last desperate resort of capitalists saving the system from being overthrown by the proletariat. Fascism uh, is when finance capital uses like a mass movement, mainly composed of, uh, of petty bourgeois and lampons as shock troops, to destroy completely any collective organization of the working class. And I think um, uh, we often say that fascism bases itself on the middle classes and the petty bourgeoisie. And we don't just say it because we saw it in the 30s. There's a reason for it. <laughs> because the working class are the ones that can defeat capitalism. <laughs> if they act together in a mass movement, it endangers the capitalists. So, so, so they need a mass of people that does not uh, challenge the rule. So in fascism, they, 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 they used armed gangs to wipe out trade unions, illegalize any workers' parties, and install a regime of brutal dictatorship to, to, to hinder and keep uh, down any collective expression of the working class. Keep them individualized and atomized. But this is not the preferred option for the capitalists. And most of all, this is not something the capitalists can just decide to do. Not any politician or any party or even uh, the whole ruling class can just decide to install fascism. In the 30s, it took a series of historical deep defeats of the proletariat. The deep uh, defeat of, of several uh, German revolutions. The Italian uh, revolutionary movement, the, the, the Austrian revolution in 1918, later on the Spanish revolution, before the fascists were able to rise and take power. And even then, the bourgeoisie was extremely worried that they would lose everything in this process. They were very worried about provoking a civil war against the proletariat, that they were not sure they could win. I mean, in Austria, they had to, they had to wait 16 years after the revolution of 1918, waiting until the social democracy with their reformism had completely demoralized the working class, before they were able to build an extremely unstable, very weak, half fascism, the so-called Austro-fascism in 1934. In Britain, they never managed to do it. And, and, and what is the situation today, if we look at it? The, the middle classes and petty bourgeoisie, uh, layers that were previously supporters of fascism, such as uh, teachers, uh, doctors, uh, students. Today they have come, become pro proletarianized and are often the ones who are on the forefront of strike movements. The, the, the working class is a hugely powerful, powerful potential force that the ruling class fears. I mean, the U.S. right now can't even send ground troop, troops to any of the foreign wars because they fear mass opposition at home. Just imagine if they tried to, to send these troops against their own workers. And, uh, actually, during, during the, this election campaign, both Trump and Biden felt uh, obliged to visit striking auto workers although Biden was careful to choose a non-unionized car factory, to garner their support and vote. And Trump was not going there to shoot them. And we have already seen some of these right-wingers in office, in practice. Bolsonaro in Brazil, Trump, the Law and Justice Party in, in Poland, Meloni in Italy, the Freedom Party in Austria. None of these countries have become fascist. All these right-wing demagogues turn out to be very reactionary, but ultimately normal bourgeois leader in the current context of the world, as normal as you can be. Well, a bit edgy, but like, uh, not, no, not fascism. <laughs> uh, even Bolsonaro, who maybe dreamed of becoming a, a dictator, he was not able to do so. His, his government was weak and unstable. And this is the, in, in line with the general process of, cap, of this capitalist crisis. 
unstable, shaky regimes that can only hold themselves up because of this lamentable role of the reformist leaders, trade union leaders, the party leaders. So most of all, we have to see at what stage of the process of capitalist crisis we're at. The working class has not at all been defeated. Um, there were some defeats, but not like uh, full, full uh, dest d d destructive defeats. Overall, uh, on the contrary, the working class is only just starting to move. We're not at the end of a revolutionary uh, period or process, but at the beginning. So to create a mass panic of rising fascism would be a complete misjudgment of the situation and would lead communists to make serious mistakes that would completely uh, distract and hinder us from the work that revolutionaries uh, actually have to do right now. Uh, if we were serious about fascism, what we, would we, what, what we ha would have to do right now is starting immediate preparation to arm the working class, prepare for civil war, but just imagine going to work as in, in Germany or Austria or the US today, and telling them that they need to start uh, doing militia training and procur procuring weapons. This would completely alienate us from the best workers. And they would correctly think that we were crazy. The perspective that we're facing around the world today is one of rising class struggle in the coming period. Th this is what we have to prepare for. And this is why we need to urgently build the forces of revolutionary uh, communism. So um, the, the, the title of the talk is uh, Right Populist and, and How to Fight Them. So how do we fight the right today in the present situation? Um, and I've, uh, with good reason, spent a lot of time in explaining the deep crisis our system is failing. Um, how the crisis of capitalism is the crisis of democracy and the crisis of reformism which is creating the conditions for the right wing to rise. And this, is, uh, this approach always has to be our starting point. We have to have a clear understanding of the objective situation. What are the class relations at present? Where is the process going and at what stage in this process are we? What are the specifics in uh, the country where I'm politically active? I mean, I've given an overview here, but there are specifics in every country. And if we get the uh, objective analysis wrong, we will draw completely wrong conclusions for the, our practical work. So, we, we, we have the, the deepest crisis, uh, crisis of capitalism in its history, of which uh, the rise of the right wing is only one expression, um, uh, the direction moving towards class struggle and revolution. But uh, we cannot be impatient with the working class. We cannot write, it, write them off when there is a momentary swing to the right. <clears throat> Yes, um, but of course we're communists and we're not mere commentators. Uh, we don't stop at analyzing, analyzing the situation. We, we must actively intervene in the class struggle and, and also um, in the fight, against, the, the fight against the right. But here the most important thing is that we have a clear class position. Uh, we start, of course, with uh, saying we completely reject the reactionary agenda of the right wing because they divide the working class and sow hatred. We say no to racism, sexism, Islamophobia, and so on. We say kick the capitalists out, not, not refugees. But if the working class fought back on a class basis against not only the right, but like the social problems they face, the, 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 the workers face, these, these right-wing demagogues would have nothing to offer. They would just crumble. And uh, we have to be very clear that uh, the, our reasons to fight the right-wing have nothing in common with the hypocritical liberals that they claim to be against the right, but actually just defend the same system that gave rise to the right in the first place. We're against the unity with liberals and the bourgeoisie. We reject lesser evilism, where the liberals try to chain the working class to the bourgeoisie. I mean, we don't endorse Joe Biden just because we, want, uh, we, we don't like uh, Trump. We don't support the Greens just become the, because they claim to be more left. We also criticize the criminal policy of the reformists, where they use the control they have over the workers' organization to subordinate the working class under the bourgeoisie. And when they claim to fight the right, when they claim to fight the right, they just parrot the liberals. 
instead of standing on a clear class position against the capitalists. So we need to explain what the actual tasks of the leaders of the working class should be and are. And at the moment, we're too small to pose an alternative to the leadership of the uh, current uh, working organization. We cannot replace them or, and uh, sometimes not even seriously uh, challenge them in practice most of the time. But we sh should uh, use opportunities when we get them to show in practice how it makes a difference to fight the right with a working class approach and prove uh, that we have the correct ideas. And these chances will come more often as we become bigger, a bigger force. Uh, and this is important <clears throat> um, uh, because uh, the re revolutionary process is only at its beginning and not at its end. But we do not have endless time of, uh, on our hands. We live in a revolutionary period of world history. And revolutions do not wait for us to be ready. We really have uh, the question of a successful socialist revolution in our lifetime before us. And we have to make sure that it can su succeed. Which is why we have to grow urgently and build the revolutionary communist international. Because ultimately, only the revolutionary overthrow of capitalism can really start to root out all the forms of oppression and hatred and get rid of the, the, the root of what makes the right wing rise. We, we fight for the full emancipation of all humankind, for communism and for a successful revolution in our lifetime. Thanks very much, Yola. I think we uh, can all agree that was a fantastic introduction. We've got plenty of time for discussion now. First, I will bring in uh, Bryce from the United States and then Johanna Johannes from Brazil. Well, for a temporary period after World War II, American workers were in a relatively good position. There was a significant upswing for US capitalism, which lasted almost three decades. Jobs were plentiful and real wages were rising. And several generations of workers became accustomed to this. So this period ended in the mid 1970s. And since then, American capitalism has been in a period of protracted decline. And to get a sense of this, we can look at the manufacturing industry in the US. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there were 19.6 million manufacturing jobs in 1979. That fell by 35% down to 12.8 million by 2019. And that's an even larger loss if you factor in the overall, the growth of the total US population since the 70s. This same report also notes that since 1979, employment in that factor, in that sector fell during each of five recessions that have occurred. And in each case, employment never fully recovered to pre-recession levels. And that, of course, has a ripple effect on other jobs and industries. Concretely speaking, this means that many towns and smaller cities have been completely gutted. And real wages and conditions have either stagnated or declined for the workers who still do work in those industries. And of course, that's not the only problem facing the American working class. There's other issues like the opiate crisis. There were 20,000 deaths from opiate overdose in 1999, up to 90,000 in 2020. This is occurring in many of the same states where the manufacturing industry has been gutted. And then there's also things like the housing affordability crisis, which means that the, uh, the dream of owning your own home, the so-called American dream, has become out of reach for millions of people. This was, the context in, this was the context in which the 2016 presidential election unfolded. The candidate of the Democratic Party, Hillary Clinton, was openly putting herself forward as the continuation of Obama in every way. Her message was essentially, everything is going great and we're gonna keep going on this track. <laughs> Trump, meanwhile, was saying, there's a problem in society. He was saying, you're angry and you should be angry. He was saying we need to drain the swamp of politicians in Washington, D.C. He displayed a clear fighting spirit and total contempt for the norms of the political establishment and tapped into the anger, the legitimate anger of millions and managed to win the presidency. 
of course, Trump is part of the class that uh, props up this establishment that he rails against. He's swindling people. He's not sincere, of course. But he manages to pose as someone who looks out for the average Joe. And since 2016, he's maintained this support and maintained this image he's created. As Yola mentioned, the main responsibility for this lies on the labor leaders and the so-called left. Bernie Sanders, for instance, had the opportunity to cut across this poison. But in, in summer 2016, he absolutely could have launched a new party, which would have started with a significant base of support. It could have channeled the anti-establishment anger in a healthy direction. But instead, he capitulated to the Democrats and endorsed Clinton. That kind of approach will never defeat Trumpism. Only an independent working class alternative to the capitalist parties, <laughs> emphasizing class issues. <laughs> could undermine Trumpism and reframe this political polarization along class lines. In recent years, the comrades of the Revolutionary Communists of America have seen several glimpses of this possibility. <clears throat> Earlier this year, workers at the Molson Coors Brewery in Fort Worth, Texas, were striking for several weeks. Our comrades enthusiastically participated and supported their picket line and discussed our program and ideas with the workers. The workers at this factory were mainly Trump voters, but we got a friendly reception nonetheless. And the comrades noted that these workers largely viewed Trump as the lesser of two evils. And that's an important point to note because it's not just people who vote for Biden who are voting for the lesser of two evils. There's just as many who vote for, who see Biden as the main evil and vote for Trump as a concession. Trump has a small reactionary core of uh, very adamant supporters. But there's a, a larger layer of, of, of people who are primarily just dissatisfied with all options. And this is a global phenomenon. And so the comrades noticed that for these workers at the Molson Coors Brewery, their main focus was not supporting Trump, but winning their strike. To be sure, we did not win any of them over to communist ideas in the short term. But they were open to hearing what we had to say. And it seems likely that Trump will win the 2024 election. Elections in the U.S. are generally extremely close, so it's hard to say for sure. The ruling class has been trying to remove Trump from the situation, but it hasn't worked. He's not their preferred candidate. He, they see him as a destabilizing factor, as, as someone who's only looking out for his own personal whims and interests. But if anything, this actually bolsters his support, like Yola pointed out. But if he wins, it's going to be an educational experience for his base and for the whole working class. Because Trump is organically incapable of delivering on these bold promises he makes. When Trump says he's going to make America great again, it's very clear what he's referring to. He's referring to the post-World War II economic boom. But neither he nor any capitalist politician can magically bring that period back into existence. It was the product of a temporary alignment of factors. It was an exception to the norm, and it's not going to come back. So he got lucky and rode a wave of relative stability during his first term. But if he became president in January 2025 again, he would face a different situation. <laughs> Crisis and instability are the new normal. <laughs> the same economic situation that he currently blames Biden for would now become his responsibility. And this would happen in a context where the primary feature of the American political landscape is general hatred of the establishment and distrust of all institutions. A recent poll by the New York Times found that 70% of Americans either think the political system needs major reforms or it needs to be, quote, torn down entirely. And so this is where consciousness is headed in the U.S. And the election of Trump would intensify all of these dynamics. It would not cause a clampdown in the U.S. or a period of stability. It would be the opposite situation. So that's the perspective we need to prepare for. We need to build a serious class struggle organization. 
a communist party. We need to win over the advanced workers and youth first. And through that, prepare to eventually win over broader layers of the working class. Because the working class, if united against these divisions, can become an unstoppable force that can overthrow the system that Trump and Biden both represent. Thank you. After Johannes, I'll take Dina from the Netherlands. Uh, thank you, Yola, for your very uh, instructive, very good report, Lidov. I want to emphasize, emphasize uh, a characteristic of this phenomenon. The, this right populism is a, a way, a form of government to bourgeoisie take a bigger part of the share plus value of the workers. The, that kind of the plus value expressed by the wages, the direct wages in the pocket of the workers, but also an uh, indirect wage paid by the public services and the, um, the retired uh, payments of the workers. In Brazil, we had our own experience with Jair Bolsonaro. His victory, victory was prepared by some circumstances. The capitalist was wanted a more share of this plus value. The government in, the mo in that moment was unable to do what the capitalist wanted, and the government led by the, uh, uh, the, the left party of the, the, the workers' party. And the masses was more and more anger and insatisfied with this live, living of it, uh, in the society. All this find expression in the, the, the demonstrations of two, uh, 2013. Uh, uh, a real insurrection of the masses. And this continue and express it in, in, a, in a reactionary way in the parliamentary coup of 2016. It was a, a very confused process of struggle class. Porque, uh, because the government was the left, was the working party. And this led, led us to uh, the victory of Bolsonaro in 2018. A expression of the crisis of the traditional model of the politics in Brazil. The decomposition of the, the traditional right and the left in going to the center to defend the system. Before this, we, we had a, a tragic confirmation of what, what, what we are discussing here, of the problem of the lack of the dialectic in the analysis. The, 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 the reformist left concluded this that we, li we was living a conservative way in the workers. And we entered in the fascist um, period of the society. We had other analysis. Uh, the, the election of, of Bolsonaro was an uh, 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 expression of the, 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 the angry against the system. What failed was the reformist policies to the society. In, in the absence of a reference left, because the left was it uh, was, was seen like, uh, as the system by the masses. The, mass, the masses confused it, voted for Bolsonaro. But I agree that the Bolsonaro is a, a weak government, the weak basis. But what, what the, 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 the right ideal, the ideologues, ideologues uh, describe as populism, we should describe as a new kind of the Bonapartism government. Because Bolsonaro has weak bases, but he was supported by the short to apply the full program of the bourgeoisie. And this was a recipe of struggle class. The conclusions of the left have found his representants. And our conclusions, just us. <laughs> and, and, and looking what happen, happened in the, 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 the past periods of the elections, 
I was in the carnival after the elections. In, in this, that carnival, we call it Alto Bolsonaro Carnival. The fascism was, was spread from society, but the masses was painted in, in with uh, funny clothes, calling to the overthrow of the government. And this was combined with the first measures of the government against his bases, electoral bases. And our analysis led us to put a slogan forward, Bolsonaro out. And all the left was against us because his ideas and his analysis led them to the other conclusions. And other poli 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 the politics also, 15. And, but when we, we put this slogan into demonstrations, into the carnival and the other demonstrations later, <coughs> the, in the first moment, the avant-garde, but later more and more layers of the masses, look at our slogan as an answer of these feelings and push the, their leaders and their organizations to answer of the same way that us was answering. And the, all the, 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 uh, almost all the left was uh, um, obligated to say something. The five more bigger party of the left in Brazil published a declaration saying that was wrong call out Bolsonaro. But, 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 but just us uh, proposing this in the movement. I think this show another question important uh, in this discussion to how we fight against these populist rights, uh, representatives in government with the united front tactic. With this, it, it, uh, even when we have a small group and propose ideas to the movement, these ideas could uh, reach a, 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 a huge impact and influence the masses. And we, ha we can have an impact, a, a, a political force much bigger than our organizational force. It's a tactical, it's not the, just the one tactical. Uh, this, this have to combine it with our growth, our education, or our own development of the, 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 the numbers of the militants. Also. But it's a key to, to fight and defeat this, this new, new, gov, new tactic of the bourgeoisie. Despite this, in Brazil, the left was able to block the, the way of the masses. It was not easy to them. But this combined with the pandemic situation, it was very difficult in Brazil, uh, led to the masses to accept that the election was the way to, to, to continue his fight. We have now, we win this battle. We defeated this populist uh, representative of the bourgeoisie Bolsonaro. It was not a full victory. His, his followers was not smashed and we, the, 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 the following, we had um, a, not a, a socialist government. Lula is what the Third International described as a liberal worker government that lead, that, that push on the bourgeois interests. Yes. Despite this, the struggle class continuing and we are facing the, facing the attacks of this government against the workers in the very similar way a uh, line of the Bolsonaro was doing. And this kind of politics prepare uh, a return of the, the, uh, some, someone like Bolsonaro. And we need to prepare our forces to face this actual government or other kind of the bourgeoisie government in a liberal worker, the worker way of govern government or in the populist Bonapartist way. Okay, after Dina, I'll bring in Arturo from Portugal. Hi, comrades. Um, I wanted to discuss the Dutch situation. <clears throat> so I think many of you have heard the results of the elections we had in November, when Geert Wilders, the, um, <clears throat> well, the leader of the extreme right uh, party, the PVV, which is the party of freedom, he won the election. 
And it's important to look at the context uh, of the Netherlands to explain his victory. Because there's a deep economic crisis with high inflation without appropriate increase in wages, a pressing housing shortage, young people that uh, have immense student debts that will carry uh, with them with, for decades, and public services that just been hollowed out. <laughs> so for decades, actually, there's been this stagnation in the country um, and over the years, there's also been many scandals and issues in society that are just not being solved. So in Dutch society, there's immense discontent and also a deep, deep his historically low distrust in the government and institutions. And so how did the left act in this situation? What did they provide? Well, the biggest party on the left is this new fusion party of the Labour uh, Party and the Green Left with Frans Timmermans at the head of it. And this is someone who comes from the right wing of the Labour Party and works in the EU Parliament as part of the Climate Accord. Climate Accord. So he's literally the establishment and it also shows what the party uh, stands for, what the nature of it is. And then we have the Socialist Party, who once did play a progressive role in the early 2000s, but now completely watered down his politics and even took over some of the right wing rhetoric. So it's basically regarded as an irrelevant party for young people. Then there's by Ain, who lost its only seat in the parliament. And this followed from a few scandals that they had resulted from the poisonous identity politics in the party. Um, by Ain, another party, identity. So in this situation where the Dutch work, uh, yeah, the working class is struggling to make ends meet and deeply distrust the government with no alternative on the left to be found. It's not surprising that more and more people are questioning the system. And right-wing right -wing demagogues were able to respond to this situation. They managed to fill the vacuum um, and capitalize on this by blaming migrants. So before the elections, we had um, Rutte as prime minister. He's from the VVD, a right-wing bourgeois party, and been uh, the longest standing prime minister. And they were in coalitions or had agreements with almost every party in the parliament other than the PVV and the BBB, which I will come back uh, on later. <clears throat> so they are seen as the establishment that caused these many issues in society. And the working class is just now looking for something to kick the establishment, to kick these parties with. And the left is not able to provide that. So Wilders has managed to channel this discontent and to combine it with xenophobia. Also anti-immigration politics and in general a racist campaign where the so-called Dutch people were put first. But then he also combined this with more social demands. Like investments in healthcare, in education, in pensions as well. So in this demagogic way, uh, Wilders was actually able to attract this part of the working class. But there's also another far-right party that rose to the top, called the BBB, so the um, Farmers' People's Movement. And this is another uh, party that actually, um, a new party that got formed in the midst of the farmers' protests. And they became quite popular as well. And they have a reactionary, um, they have a reactionary program, of course, with harsh immigration policy um, and are for many cuts in different public sectors. <coughs> However, it's not necessarily the content of the party that a lot of people resonated with. People associated the party with the farmers' protests. And these were different than protests that we had before, organized by left-wing organizations. <coughs> they were militant. So they had strikes, even jailbreaks from arrested farmers, um, uh, blocking highways for days. So these were the methods that the BBB got associated with. And it shows that the working class chose these methods to kick the establishment with. They are now looking for respectable politicians, but for hard fighters. And that's what the rise of the far right in the Netherlands shows, actually. <coughs> Of course, these will not be the, uh, the parties that are willing or even able to implement the promises they, they have. And this is already being uh, exposed um, because we just formed the government or cabinet with the PVV, the BBB, um, PVD and NSC. <laughs> we have many parties. <laughs> 
And the last two parties are just the bourgeois right-wing uh, parties that were. But now with an extra parliamentary prime minister at the top that the ruling class can actually trust. <laughs> this is a top official that has been working in the secret services in the Netherlands. <laughs> so we're in a situation where we have a technocratic government with the so-called experts in charge. So the ruling class, of course, don't want to collaborate with Wilders or the BBB. <laughs> because they are, they are incredibly destabilizing factors in the country and outside. So they're in the process of kind of tame them down and normalize them. And it's already happening because after going into negotiations, they already said, well, we do have to be realistic about our demands and make compromises. So it's clear that they will get harshly exposed and discredited in the coming years. And this will accelerate an even more unstable situation in the Netherlands. And there are also many doom-thinking scenarios on the left, of course, of where, where this government will take us. And many cries that fascism is on the rise in the Netherlands. But the rise of the right wing um, is just one side of the situation. On the other side, we saw huge strike waves where in the last year we had the highest number of strikes in the last 50 years. The Palestine movement has also taken off in the Netherlands. Well, we had big demonstrations and encampments in universities, which is unprecedented in the, in the Netherlands. And people see the amount of money and weapons being sent to Israel, to Ukraine, <laughs> while also experiencing these many cuts from the government. And this starts to shift the consciousness of uh, people in the Netherlands. So the student uh, movement in solidarity with Palestine actually forced the biggest trade union to take a political stand <laughs> against police violence and demonstration rights, for example. And we start to see more and more of these changes. And because of that, we will not fall into the pessimistic and cynicist mood of the, of the liberals. We're going to regard the whole working class as a racist bloc. There's always, uh, there are always some backwards elements in it, of course. But we look at these facts and uh, we can see that there's an actual anti-establishment sentiment in the, in the country. And this government will, radica will radicalize young people even further. This is a layer that's looking for militancy. And we need to embrace these occasions and intervene with even more audacity among these students, among workers, and win them over politically. And they will be ready to build the Revolutionary Communist International. Thank you. Okay, after Arturo, we'll take Nani. Bourgeois democracy uh, is quite a fragile plant. And it can only flourish on the, as it should on the, on the quite specific conditions of uh, prosperity, growth, uh, and general social stability. Where, where class conciliation becomes uh, possible. And this really only has only happened in the most advanced uh, capitalist countries, imperialist uh, countries. Under ideal conditions, bourgeois democracy uh, is meant to, to conceal the dictatorship of, of capital. Bourgeois politicians become transmission belts uh, for the needs of, uh, of the capitalists. And their task is to make uh, the, the needs and the program of the ruling class uh, more palatable and to, and to justify it before the masses. Now, as I said, this can function smoothly under conditions of, 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 of prosperity. But in times of uh, crisis, this machinery starts to break down. And we see uh, cracks opening up between the bourgeoisie and its political representatives. Because the, the bourgeois politicians, they have their own uh, particular interests that do not entirely overlap with those of the ruling class. Okay. 
after all their income and their privileges depend on them winning elections, getting elected into public office. And this becomes quite hard in conditions of polarization, of crisis, of generalized anger. And as you all explained, uh, it is in those uh, periods that, uh, that the, the, the ground is prepared for demagoguery and, and so-called populism. And this opens this, this, this generates tensions between the ruling class and, and its politicians. They, became, they become uh, much more uh, unpredictable. They put their own interests, their own narrow political interests ahead, ahead of those of, the, of their class. But at the same time, in a way, these uh, right-wing populists are, are necessary to, 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 to the ruling class. Or rather, this type of demagoguery is, becomes an inevitable uh, precondition for the rule of capital in our epoch. Because yes, this, uh, these demagogues, they're, they're unpredictable, they generate more polarization, but, but at the same time, they divert popular anger away from the ruling class. They divide the working class, they distract it, they, they, they find scapegoats. So in a way, they are, they are necessary in the conditions we are, we are, we are living in. And comrades, we, we must remember that the capitalism is, is an irrational system that is in a very deep crisis. It is sinking deeper and deeper. And the political and ideological sub superstructure of a system in deep crisis will inevitably become more irrational and more grotesque. And we will become increasingly reliant on all sorts of uh, divisive questions, on, on scapegoats. That is the only way that, uh, that a small minority uh, that has completely out outlived itself, a minority of, of parasites at the head of society, can maintain itself in, in, in power. <coughs> yes, the, the, the respectable bourgeois, they do not like this uh, racism and this, this, uh, this um, eccentric uh, uh, politicians. Economically, they need uh, migrant labor. But politically, this uh, type of, 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 of politicians are, are, are necessary for them. The, the economic and the political needs of the system are, are, are in, in, entering into a growing uh, contradiction and generating more, more instability. But really, as Jola explained, the, there is a much more immediate uh, and, 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 uh, and tangible cause for the rise of this, uh, of this right wingers. The, the first instinct of the, of the masses after the 2008 crisis was to turn to the left on a healthy class uh, basis. But with the rise of reformist leaders that, that betrayed uh, uh, the, the, the masses, this, this uh, process, this turn to the left, uh, hit a, a, a wall. And now we are seeing a, 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 a turn to, to the right on the electoral front. The masses are, are, are trying to find their way. They are, they are groping around and they are, they're not finding a way out of the crisis.
And yes, the, the reformist leaders of the last decade, they betrayed the, the movement, of course. But these right-wing demagogues will also trample on all the expectations they might have uh, awakened initially, much more, much, much faster, actually. They'll end up applying the, 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 the full program of the capitalists. We are seeing this, for instance, with, with Millet in Argentina right now. And this might take some time, but this will only prepare the ground for a more violent swing towards uh, the left and the rise of new uh, uh, left reformist uh, forces under some under different guises. The masses are looking for a way out, and this is creating a, a pendulum to the right and to the left, very violent swings in, in the mood. And our task is to smash that uh, pendulum by going to the, to the heart of the matter, to the root of the problem, which is capitalism. And then, thank you. Thank you. Okay, after Nani, we'll take Franz. Vox is the, Vox is the, the party of the extreme right in Spain. Comparte características con otros movimientos similares, pero eh, tiene sus propias características que hacen diferente su impacto en la clase obrera y en la. It has similar characteristics to other movements, but it has certain uh, peculiarities that uh, impact the working class and the class struggle in Spain. Lo más importante es que mientras en otros países estos movimientos eh, tienen la apariencia de movimientos antisistema. The biggest difference is that in other countries, these movements appear to be movements against the system. Vox se presenta en España como el más firme defensor del establishment capitalista imperial. Meanwhile, Vox in Spain presents itself as the firmest defender of the establishment of imperialism and of Spanish capitalism. In particular, de la monarquía borbónica, de la Iglesia Católica, no, y, y del aparato del Estado. It particularly defends the Bourbon monarchy, the Catholic Church, and the uh, the state apparatus. Vox surge de una escisión del partido tradicional de la derecha española al Partido Popular en 2014. Vox emerged from a right-wing split from the traditional conservative uh, right-wing party of Spain, the Popular Party. Y solo adquiere un desarrollo significativo a partir de 2018 tras la derrota del movimiento revolucionario independentista catalán. That split happened in 2014, but it really only rose to prominence in 2018 after the defeat of the Catalan uh, independence referendum. Tras la frustración con Podemos en las masas. It benefited from frustration among the masses with Podemos. Y tras el descrédito del partido de la derecha tradicional, el Partido Popular, que perdió el gobierno en 2018 a manos del Partido Socialista. And because of uh, the discrediting of the popular party that uh, was thrown out of government, defeated by the, the Socialist Party. Sus banderas son fundamentalmente la lucha contra el separatismo catalán y vasco y contra la inmigración, particularmente de origen magrebí. The main uh, banner of Vox is against separatism on the part of the Catalans and the Basque, and also against uh, immigration, particularly uh, Moroccans. Justifican los, aunque no la defienden abiertamente por miedo a, a crear un movimiento de oposición muy fuerte, pero justifican todos los crímenes del franquismo y ante los ojos de las masas aparecen como como defensores de la dictadura de Franco. Uh, they also make uh, excuses and downplay Franco's uh, crimes, although they don't uh, openly embrace fascism, but the, the masses see them as apologists for Franco. Su base social son pequeños propietarios y empresarios. Justamente los que más eh, mano inmigrante, inmigrante emplea. The social base of Vox is uh, small business owners and small proprietors who are precisely the class that employ a lot of migrant uh, labor. La clase media reaccionaria, policía, el ejército y sectores de la iglesia católica. Also the reactionary layers of the middle class, police, the army and the Catholic Church as well. Eh, su apoyo en la clase obrera es pequeño. It has uh, very little support among the working class. Salvo en sectores altos, no, o periféricos. Except, o sea, bien pagado en sectores. 
except for the, the subsections of the very well paid uh, higher levels of the class. Su bandera es, digamos, la lucha contra el progresismo, el feminismo, ¿no? Y la cultura de la de izquierda. They have a, an image of fighting against progressivism, feminism, the influence of the left. Aunque están contra el derecho al aborto, no se atreven a defender con énfasis su eliminación por miedo a provocar al movimiento. They're against the right to abortion, but uh, they don't really put this demand forward uh, so prominently because they're afraid of provoking a mass response. Su modelo económico no es el estatalismo burgués, sino el ultraliberalismo. Uh, their economic uh, model is not uh, bourgeois uh, Stat statalism, sta statism, statism but rather extreme neoliberalism. A diferencia de la extrema derecha, por ejemplo, en Francia o Italia, donde se nutren de sectores plebeyos, entre comillas. Uh, in contrast to the extreme right in countries like France and Italy that uh, are nourished by sections of like uh, plebeian uh, working class. Eh, Vox se nutre de sectores de la clase media alta y de la burguesía. Vox uh, rests on sections of the middle class and the bourgeoisie. Y es visto por la clase trabajadora como enemigos de clase. And the workers see Vox as a class enemy. Son prosionistas chocando con la mayoría de la población española. Prosionistas. Prosionistas, por favor, de Israel. Oh, they're, they're pro-Zionist. Uh, y provocan un odio y reacción igual y en sentido contrario a la clase trabajadora, ¿no? And they, they, they provoke a lot of rejection and hatred on the part of the, the working class against them. Hay límites muy claros para la penetración de Vox en el corazón de la clase obrera española. There are very serious limitations for Vox's ability to, to penetrate into the heart of the, the working class. Porque representa todo lo que esta odia, y en particular sus capas avanzadas. Because Vox uh, represents everything that the working class hates, particularly the advanced layers. El franquismo, las políticas propatronales. Franquismo, uh, the pro-boss, uh, pro-corporate uh, policies. La incultura, la violencia machista. Uh, lack of culture, uh, uh, sexist violence. El nacionalismo español y la monarquía. Spanish nationalism, the monarchy. Por eso nunca podrán arraigar en las masas de la clase obrera. That's why they will never be able to uh, sink roots in the working class. Y cualquier avance suyo preparará una radicalización hacia la izquierda muy peligrosa para la clase dominante. And any step forward that they take will only provoke a radicalization of the class struggle. Por eso la burguesía española está alarmada ante una eventual coalición de gobierno futura entre el PEP, Partido Popular y Vox. That's why the ruling class is growing alarmed about the possibility of an electoral coalition between Vox and the, the Popular Party. Por el miedo a que se deta, a, a que se desate un estallido popular de abajo. Because they're afraid that it's going to unleash a social explosion from below. Y por ahora sus intereses están mejor salvaguardados por el gobierno socialista de Pedro Sánchez. For the time being, the interests of the bourgeoisie are in better hands in the government, the so-called socialist government of Pedro Sánchez. Aunque desconfíen de él por su carácter aventurero, ¿no? El carácter aventurero de Pedro Sánchez. Although they don't, they also have, uh, they don't trust him because of his uh, adventurous uh, traits. Por otro lado, ya en un sentido más general. In a more general sense. Tenemos que barrer a un lado la histeria pesimista, ¿no? Que existe en la izquierda ante el auge de la extrema derecha. We have to sweep aside the pessimistic hysteria of the right of, of the left wing that's sounding the alarm bells about fascism. El optimismo del marxismo nace del hecho constatable de que el capitalismo para existir necesita del trabajo asalariado. The optimism of the Marxist grows out of the irrefutable fact that capitalism requires the wage labor of the working class. Incluso en las peores condiciones en que este trabajo se realiza, ¿no? de crisis, de degradación moral, etc. And analyzing the conditions that this, uh, that this process takes place, uh, conditions of crisis, demoralization. Por lo tanto, digamos, los trabajadores necesitarán siempre, tarde o temprano, agruparse And this is why sooner or later the workers will always find themselves forced to join together para defenderse to defend themselves y que inevitablemente desarrollarán una conciencia de oposición a sus patrones. And they will inevitably develop a consciousness of opposition against the interests of the bosses. Una conciencia de clase. Class consciousness. Que de que se levantarán y lucharán. They will stand up and they will fight. Esta es la base material del optimismo comunista. 
This is the material base of communist optimism. El límite al avance hegemónico social, ¿no? De la ultraderecha no es no es solamente una cuestión de número, de la fuerza de la clase obrera y de la debilidad de la pequeña burguesía. The the limitations, the objective limitations for the advance of the right are not just a, a question of uh, of numbers. Son también sus valores morales y de clase. It's it's also clashes with the uh, the the values and the class interests of, of the working class. Los valores de la ultraderecha son la apelación individual. The right wing, the, the values of the right wing appeals to uh, individual rights. El egoísmo. Egoism. El desinterés por el sufrimiento de los demás. Uh, um, not caring about the suffering of others. La opresión sobre otros. Oppression uh, over others. El individuo desgajado de su clase. The individual uh, broken off from their class. Ideas que solo pueden incidir fundamentalmente en la pequeña burguesía. These are ideas that really can only resonate fundamentally with the middle class. Pero los valores de la clase obrera son colectivos. The values of the working class are collective. La solidaridad y el apoyo mutuo. Solidarity and mutual support. La sensibilidad hacia la injusticia y la opresión. Sensitivity to injustice and oppression. Relaciones personales desinteresadas. Desinteresadas. Uh, a disinterest in uh, personal relations. Sin interés. Uh, open, genuine social relations. Y sobre todo la movilización de masas que siempre arrinconan estas tendencias individualistas e irracionales. And it's always the mobilization of the masses that uh, forces these uh, individualist tendencies to one side. Las condiciones materiales condicionan los valores morales e ideológicos, tarde o temprano. Sooner or later, material conditions uh, shape the ideological forces. Y los valores de la ultraderecha, que son los valores capitalistas extremos, and the values of the right wing that are extreme capitalist values, chocan con las condiciones de vida de la clase obrera, inevitablemente, they inevitably clash with the living conditions of the working class, y generarán una reacción en sentido contrario. And they'll generate a, uh, an opposite reaction. Esto no quiere decir que debamos adoptar una posición conformista y pasiva. This doesn't mean that we should adopt a, a passive conformist position. Diciendo que no importan los avances temporales de la ultraderecha o anunciando su fracaso inevitable. Uh, we shouldn't dismiss the advances of the right wing or announce its inevitable failure. Hasta el, el, hasta el enemigo más débil puede vencer si no se le opone una resistencia. Even the weakest enemy can uh, can be victorious if there's no opposition against them. De lo que se trata es de que inspiremos nuestra lucha contra la ultraderecha con este optimismo de clase. But what we have to do is inspire our struggle against the right wing with this optimism. Que nace de la confianza en la clase misma. An optimism born out of confidence in the class itself. En la confianza de que su conciencia se forjará a través de sus condiciones de vida y de su experiencia de lucha. Confidence that its uh, consciousness will be forged in its life experience and in the experience of the struggle. Se trata de imbuirnos del optimismo que nace de la conciencia de combatir en el lado correcto de la historia. We have to be imbued with the confidence that comes from fighting on the right side of history. El optimismo de que nuestra lucha y nuestra clase son invencibles. Confidence that our class and our struggle are invincible. El optimismo de que combatiremos y venceremos. The optimism that we will fight and we will win. Thank you. After Franz, we'll take Niklas. So, um, comrades, I'd like to talk about the AFD, the Al Alternative for um, Germany. As you know, uh, last weekend there were the European elections and I would say it was a victory for the AFD. In the whole of Germany, they got 16%, which, but, the, but, but, but they were the, the second um, um, strongest um, party after the Conservatives. But I think what is even more relevant is that the parties of the of the um, current uh, yeah of the um, current coalition the social democrats the um, greens and the liberals had huge losses huge losses and in the in some eastern um, german federal states where the aft is particularly um, strong it looks m more ex more extreme like in in saxony in the state of saxony the aft got 43% First, like the, the, the being the um, biggest party, the second party are the conservatives with 23%, so a 20 percentage point uh, 
um, difference in between. And the third party is another demagogic populist party. I don't have time to exp explain it. And that's it. These are the only, if this w would be a state election, th these three parties would be the only ones who come into, into parliament, that get into parliament. I'm sure those uh, parliament debates were, would be quite entertaining. <laughs> no, but, but getting back to the serious point here, um, this is a huge defeat and a huge victory for the AFD. After what? After half a year of attacks, attacks a, 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 and more um, attacks of the liberal a, um, establishment of the bourgeois politicians against the AFD. Um, Yola mentioned that already. They were trying to have a huge media scandal about uh, alleged R Russian and Chinese um, spies with, within the AFD. They, they used not all they could, but a lot of resources from the state, from the media, from like, uh, sorry, sorry. And, and it didn't help. They got humiliated and the Social Democratic Party got the worst result they ever got with 13.9%. Olaf Scholz's party. Why does the ruling class don't like them? I think Jola did a good um, job of explaining that. They are anti-EU and pro-Russia. That's not good for German capital. They are unreliable. But now this progressive bourgeoisie, the liberals of the Social Democrats and the Greens, try to portray themselves as the big fighters against the right. The defenders of democracy, the big defenders of democracy. This is a huge mockery, obviously, be because um, they are quite anti-democratic when it touches the interests of, of the ruling class. And they are very contradictory. Two weeks ago, some posh kids in the island of Sylt sang like racist slogans at a party, German, Germany to the Germans. And there was this huge scandal, like, how can that happen? A week later, some poor, mentally deranged Afghan guy stabbed a police officer in Mannheim. And then the media for a week at least was full of, we have to depart to Afghanistan, we have to depart to Af Afghanistan by the same people, by the same politicians. Also, also the repression against the, the um, Palestine movements, movement shows very clearly that those defenders of democracy are not defenders of democracy at all, that they are very hypocritical. For example, the Liberal Party now said, Democratic rights only for German people. Foreigners should not be allowed to have um, demonstrations. With liberals like this, who needs right-wing populists? <laughs> and the hypocrisy also becomes clear uh, in how they treat the AFD. They treat the AFD with very, in a very undemocratic way. A high-ranking, how do you say, civil servant of the um, government who is responsible for East Germany. His name is... Marco Wanderwitz, and his surname translates to walking um, joke, which is very true. <laughs> he says he's convinced that not a small part of the electorate don't have good intentions with our democracy. <laughs> Naughty boys and girls. Um, and that's why he wants to make the AFD illegal. He said we have to make the AFD illegal because, he says, with political methods alone, we will not get rid of them. I thought democracy was supposed to be the free market of, of ideas and so on. Obviously, it's not. And the point is, of course, the masses see all this. And this hypocrisy is open for everyone to see. And, that, and that's why, yeah, why, why it didn't help at all. It doesn't help at all. It dis, dis, um, is it um, dis, um, um, dis um, credits the, the ruling regi regime, so to speak. Why did the AFD rise to the successes they have recently? Think, I think also that was explained very well in the lead-off. First of all, who, like, who is responsible? First of all, the establishment parties and the ruling, ruling class that did austerity and attacks on the living standards uh, of the masses for 30 years. The AFD c consists, I think, mainly of petty bourgeois who are afraid of decline of social decline caused by inflation, energy prices, Russo-Ukrainian war, and so on. And, sec and secondly, who is responsible is the reformists, obviously, the, the leaders of, of, of the workers' movement. The SPD completely uh, enacts the program of financial um, capital. Now, Die Linke, the left, some of you might remember, um, 
especially in the east of, of Germany, they used to be the mass workers, workers' party because it was like the old rest of the GDR. And after 2008 and in the early two, 2010s, after the Occupy movement, after the financial crisis in, um, in um, Greece and so on in, in Europe, they gained support. And even in, in the West, there, there was some movement in there, some yeah, momentum, they gained momentum. They got certain electoral uh, um, um, successes, but they used all this not to wage a fight against capitalism, against the, um, the um, government, against the um, attacks, but only to get well-paid uh, the well-paid um, jobs in the state, in, 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 in state, state um, governments, and so on. And now that they declined, they had 2.9 percent, I think, in the European election. 2.9. Three. So this also cannot, cannot represent a radical opposition from the left, a radical alternative to the status quo. And I talked about the east of Germany. The AfD is the um, strongest there. After the GDR was unified with Germany, annexed, I would, I, would, I would like to say, the Western German ruling class basically took all the machines and factories and carried them out of the country to somewhere else and left it de-industrialized. So infrastructure, living standards are shit, like your whole um, um, biographies of a whole generation of people was completely destroyed. What did the mighty German trade union fed fed um, federation do in this time, 90s and early 2000s? They helped. They basically helped carrying out all the machines out of, out of the country, cutting the jobs, closing the factories. In this climate, it's, it's, it's very obvious. I mean, if the AFD is the only opposition, seems to be the only opposition, you can see how they gain um, support. And they are the only party in the German parliament who criticizes the Ukraine war, Germany's involvement in the Ukraine war against um, um, Russia. The only one. This year in autumn, we will have um, state elections in three Eastern German states, Thuringia, Saxony and Brandenburg. These are the states where the AfD is um, 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 strongest, and they might very well be the, the strongest um, power in, in one or two of, of these elections, or all three of them even. Uh, and we might, and of course now there is a lot of pressure, for example, on Die Linke, on the left party, which is still a little bit big in Thuringia to work with the bourgeois parties. For example, to go into a coalition, coalition with the conservatives to pre prevent the AfD. Of course, we have to resist this, as Yoda explained. That is not th the way we fight the AfD. That's the way we make the AfD stronger. But the key thing is we could very well have a major constitutional crisis, state um, crisis, in one or two of those Eastern German states because it's not possible to, to, to build a coalition. And the masses and the youths are watching this. The rise of the right, the hypocrisy of, of the bourgeois politicians and defenders of the democracy and, and all of that spectacle. And that has a relevant impact on their consciousness that we can um, 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 connect with. Thank you. Okay, Nicholas will be the next speaker. We'll see how much time we have after he's finished. Hans' contribution made me think of uh, a poem by Bertolt Brecht. It's, co it's called The Solution. I'll just read the last lines. Would it not be easier in, in that case for the government to dissolve the people and elect another? I'm sure that's how a lot of the bourgeois feel, politicians feel about the situation right now. Trotsky made... Um, a related point in one of his writings. He said that the power of finance capital is not such that it at any point can impose a government uh, of its liking. It doesn't possess that power. Its strength lies in that any government, as long as it doesn't expropriate the means of production, basically hand the power to the working class, will inevitably, in the last analysis, have to defend the interest of finance capital. And I think that kind of explains some of the situation that we face at the moment. Um, obviously, he was talking here referring to the 1930s and fascism, uh, but these forces that we are talking about, th there is a parallel, or there are similarities. Trotsky was also very critical of uh, those who exaggerated the threat of fascism. 
He says this leads inevitably to political mistakes. And we can see today how this is the exaggerating the threat of fascism leads uh, to the political mistake of, of lesser evilism. By whipping up a hysteria of, uh, uh, oh, the fascists are coming, the fascists are coming. And this is what they're doing in Germany now. They're basically trying to push the working class electorate to accept any old, uh, uh, to vote for the bourgeois parties or the social democrats and so on, which are parties they hate. And this kind of policy is a, it's a disaster for the, working, the labor movement or for the left, but obviously it allows the bourgeois to buy themselves some time in order to prepare the ground. It's not the first time in history that this kind of development takes place, this question of lesser evilism. In fact, in the years leading up to, the ta uh, to Hitler taking power, this was the policy of the Social Democrats in Germany. Every ministry before uh, leading up to the Hitler was becoming progressively more right-wing. They even, uh, you know, say they over, you know, it stepped over the mark and basically became a half dictatorship bourgeois dictatorship, um, what we would call bonapartism. But every step of the way, they had the support of the Social Democrats. And that, in combination with the com ultra-leftism of the Communist Party at that time, was what prepared the way for Hitler to take power. And cr you can read in Trotsky's writings throughout the period, he was extremely critical about this policy. A few years later, he wrote about a similar development in France. And he described a similar phenomena where the petty bourgeoisie are uh, lose trust in their political representatives. Basically, the center ground is disappear was it disappearing, yeah. and in uh, and in the case of uh, uh, France, this was the Radical Party, which had been the partly of stabilizing the republic. <laughs> but it was the, its support was melting away. It did not have a base in society, much like the traditional liberals or conservatives in Germany lost their base of support. In France, it wasn't just the Social Democrats who were trying to keep them, prop them up. But in France, this is 1936 or so, right? The Communist Party, you know, they had done a 180 degree turn and now they were supporting the uh, Popular Front. So they were, so the Communist Party, the Social Democrats, they were all trying to hold up, prop up the center ground or the radicals. And so you can see precisely the same problem. You have this situation where the petty bourgeoisie are losing their faith in the system. And what is needed is the working class to show a way out, preparing the way to revolution and overthrowing of capitalism. But the parties of the working class, instead of doing that, they try to prop up the status quo that everyone hates. And the consequence is that they get discredited along with the system as a whole. There's another uh, quote where talks, uh, Trotsky talks about democracy. And he repeated this quote in his last writing, so he must be thought it was a good one. He says, there's no epoch in human history so saturated with antagonisms as ours. And he talks about the tension that exists in uh, European society. And he says that under such high tension, the fuses of democracy blow out. And hence, you have the short circuit of dictatorship. And that is what we... Uh, in a certain sense, this, we, see, we see some of that taking place now. We can, we can see how there is now uh, constant uh, pressure to remove democratic rights and so on. But there is also some important differences. So although we see that on one hand, we, there's another process on the other hand. And that is the fact that today, what is keeping the system afloat is the leadership of the working class. The capitalism needs the leadership of trade unions in particular in order to stabilize the situation for them. So they cannot go on the full frontal attack against the trade union. It would be like sawing off the branch that they were sitting on. The class balance of forces in society are completely different to what they were in the 1930s. And the, and the ruling class is aware of that. You could see it in Britain, for example, when it came to the Palestine demonstrations. Well, we had uh, the Ministry of the Interior, or Home Secretary, as they call it. She was telling the police to attack the demonstrations. Basically, ban the demonstrations. That's what she was saying. Now, uh, she's meant to be in charge of the police. They're meant to listen to what she says. But uh, they just said, no, we can't do that. We're not doing that. That's not legal. Like, the police care about things like the law. <laughs> but it was clear that there were bourgeoisie were telling them, look, don't listen to what she's saying. And I mean, you just think about it. 
Ima imagine they mobilized all the police, you know, 40,000 police officers or something to London, and they had them attack a demonstration of half a million people. Um, they probably would have managed to dissolve the demonstration, but, but they would have, the whole city would have been up in arms. They, they'd be fighting on every street in the whole city with lo lo small groups of protesters. There'd be riots in the whole city. Basically, there was no way they could suppress these demonstrations, even if they wanted to. And these are, it's just, just one example of the class balance of forces. I would say there's another thing about fascism. We do see some fascist attacks at the moment, um, but they're relatively limited in scope. They are occasional and so on, and often met by some response. There was the very instructive uh, example in Greece, where the fascists attacked and killed a hip-hop artist. And it led to an uprising of the whole neighborhood. And suddenly the, um, the state felt ob obliged to arrest the, not just the fascists responsible for this crime, but the leadership of the party, Golden Dawn. Because of the pressure, they were worried what was going to happen if they did not take action against these fascists. There's another example in Sweden where the fascists were constantly provoking. For, for, for a couple of years, they were constantly provoking, attacking demonstrations and so on. Then they, uh, then they called a demonstration in Gothenburg. There's going to be a show of force. I think they mobilized about 500 people by mobilizing all the fascists in the whole of Scandinavia. But workers and, you know, and had enough of these, people, of these fascists. So more or less spontaneously, 20,000 counter-protesters gathered. The police erected some barriers to keep them apart. But the counter-protesters removed the barriers and started marching against the fascists. And then the police decided, well, it's better to keep the fascists away, so hold them here. And the fascist idiots, they started fighting with the police. And they got, they got soundly beaten by the police. And then they disappeared. From, for, for a couple of years, they completely disappeared from Sweden. It also gives you know, like a sense of the balance of forces once the working class and the young people mobilize against these groups. So, so it's important that we remember the strength that we have behind us. The immense power of the working class, not just in the 1930s, but the immense, much more strengthened working class that we have today. And when it's mobilized, it's capable of sweeping away all of these uh, right-wingers with no problem at all. And the real battle is to, uh, with win, uh, is to win over the working class, to win them to a correct program, to give them the leadership that they deserve, and consign capitalism and these forces to history. Okay, thanks very much, Niklas, and all comrades for contributing. I'll pass to Yola now to sum up the discussion for 20 minutes. Um, yes, thank you for all the contributions. And I think this is really what this kind of discussion needs, to have more concrete uh, examples and in-depth examples of the process today. Uh, we really live in the age of imperialist decay. And you can see it everywhere. But I thought it was very interesting how Bryce described like, how, what is it doing to the imperialist centers, the previously stable imperialist countries, how the, uh, the, this tendency of imperialism uh, to, to, uh, where finance capital becomes more and more important, and uh, this process of um, outsourcing industrial jobs undermines um, areas of sectors of the working class in these countries, like this one. Destabilizes uh, the situation of the uh, of the whole system, and there's also this process. Uh, th these were the, the layers that the traditional um, the, the trade unions and, uh, and the, the workers' parties leaned on. This was the, this, this was the basis. This labor aristocracy, but the the working conditions in the industry or the deindustrialization completely undermines this as well. Yeah. And this means that the the, the this old uh, leaders, reformist leaders of the unions and the parties, they, they get completely divor divorced from the, the feeling of the working class, the, the lives, even more. There is also this uh, question of, of migration, migrant workers uh, coming into the country, taking uh, bad jobs, uh, b badly paid jobs, uh, and they're often not uh, unionized. But we see how even in these layers of class, uh, the working class, now there's a radicalization and a, an organization drive happening in the last years. A part of the working class that is not uh, um, used to those old traditions uh, of, the, of the reformists. And who also mostly cannot vote. Um, 
in, in Vienna, I mean, the 33%, more than a third, uh, like a third of the, the voters in the voting age cannot, they, they, they cannot vote, they're not voters, <laughs> which we also have to consider when we think about uh, this rise of the, the right wing. Uh, they, they appeal to a, a, a big section of the working class, they, they can never be represented by them, basically. But this creates a situation uh, where, as, as was described, that um, you go to a picket line and then you meet Trump voters there. And that is a generally, we also notice in Austria, we, the social partnership, the social democracy is very strong, like, has very deep roots in the workers' movement. But the, the same workers that in the workplace like, uh, go around uh, with a Freedom Party merchandise are not the strike breakers. They want to fight, but they're very critical of this reformist social partnership leadership of the trade unions. So this is another uh, thing how this, uh, the, um, the, the, the imperialist decline, it really undermines the old stability in, in every way. And, and you see uh, how, this, uh, uh, how unions become, uh, get pressurized, there are cracks in this union uh, leadership. And then the US uh, leaders, union leaders like uh, Sean Fein uh, come, come to the top. Um, and so uh, finance capital, who, who rules uh, society as we know, <clears throat> they, they, they have a bit of a difficult situation with uh, all these uh, stabili pillars of stability melting away. Uh, uh, Nicholas, Nicholas said, uh, they, the financial capital, they cannot handpick their representatives as they, as they want. It doesn't work like that. They, they cannot put all their eggs in one basket either. In some way, they need these right-wing demagogues even, as was explained by Arturo. In other cases, they try to arrange with them, as with Gerd Wilders. And some just, like, we see now, like oil bosses, but even Silicon Valley bosses, tentatively supporting Trump, donating big chunks of money, work with what they have. And I'm saying this because uh, these splits in the ruling class, they are important that we see them. Um, there is an own logic uh, uh, of... Um, uh, there, there are different interests within the ruling class as well. For example, Franz correctly said that uh, the, the big finance capital in Germany, they, they are full on board with U the Ukraine war now. But actually, being cut off of Russian energy is not very good for a lot of industrial capitalists in Germany. Um, and then also the parties, as, uh, as was explained in the discussion, the, the, the different parties of the bourgeoisie, they have their own interests and their own logic. And uh, that uh, means there is, yeah, as, I, as was explained, there's also a difference between the political immediate need of certain parties and the general needs of uh, big chunks of, of, of capitalism. So we cannot have a mechanical, economic, economistic view of how uh, these crises develop. We cannot calculate, oh, the finance capital needs this program, ergo this will happen in politics and society. And uh, I think really um, a, a, a Marxist masterpiece of understanding this dialectics of politics and economy um, is, is Marx's writing on a class struggle in France, uh, 1848 to 1850. Um, uh, but uh, when we read this book, we have to think that uh, this was before uh, the imperialist stage of, of, of capitalism, with, with, which brings a little, uh, a, a few peculiarities to today's situation. It's a change, it's a new state, the last, the highest stage of capitalism. It's not the same as the early stages of bourgeois democracy, basically. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, as Lenin wrote, like, imperialism wants, I don't know the English translation, imperialism wants rule and not, not freedom. It wants oppression, not freedom. So in imperialist crises, especially, there, there, there is this tendency of using the state apparatus and using rep the repressive machine more and more. Yeah, that, so you could say, yeah, there is this general tendency towards, I don't know, military dictatorship or bonapartism. It, it, yeah, there's this uh, direction of the process. Bonapartism being, being the rule of the sword, um, where, where, which bases itself on using the military and the police to, to balance between the classes and rule with iron fist. But today is not the 1930s, as, Nic as Nicholas explained. There are important differences between then and now. The biggest difference being the, the strength of the working class, even if it's only in potential because of the leaders. So we cannot say that uh, populism is just um, a weaker form of Bonapartism or something like that. We cannot substitute um, a bourgeois imprecise term with a Marxist term, 
and have the same schematic approach to the real world process. Uh, which is why I found it very helpful to have all these different examples from different countries. <coughs> um, when, we did, uh, when we looked at these examples, uh, right, uh, we have to differentiate between uh, reformists and right-wing demagogues. They are similar in the sense the same process of crime uh, um, brings left reformists to the top or, and brings uh, right uh, demagogues uh, can bring them to the top. Uh, both, they are similar in the sense that both give illusionary answers to the problems, one by promising a rational Keynesianist or whatever program for the workers, uh, with the, being the left reformists. <laughs> and uh, the, the other side, the right wing demagogues being de bringing racist, dem demagogic, uh, completely divisive uh, so seeming solutions to the problem. But these are different, different things. We have to look at the, the class forces they unleash and then they, they lean on. What, what, what class processes they and, and, and uh, strengthen. And Nani also explained this. Uh, the petty bourgeois ideology has a completely uh, different uh, meaning than like yeah, the, the thinking of working class when it acts collectively. And we have most of all to see like uh, these uh, left reformists or whatever, they, they give uh, um, the, the chance for workers to have some class struggle experience, even if it ends in a defeat. So these are different phenomena. Um, to put them together, I mean, it, it's a bit like uh, when Trotsky criticized the social fascism theory of, of, the, <laughs> of the Stalinists. Yeah, both help finance capital to be in power. But it's a complete mistake to say, to say like, oh, we fight against the, the social democracy, same as we fight against the fascists. So this also means we have to have a very concrete uh, approach to what is the situation in the different countries, right? The tactical approach. Um, um, a comrade said, uh, talked about the, the, the united front. And the idea of the united front is uh, you, you put practical demands on the leaders of, uh, of other reformist parties. You, you put practical work, um, um, suggest practical work, in order to expose them and win the workers over. So it's, it's a strategy to grow as the, revolutionary, as the revolutionaries and not to uh, put all left wings together to have a uh, left-wing unity or something like that. It's <clears throat> but even this, it's easy to say, yeah, we need United Front. Because we need uh, to combat the reformists um, so we can uh, have a class struggle and defeat the right wing. But here again, there are also here, there are no schema schemas that we can apply. If we look at Germany, as uh, Franz explained, you can see how completely hypocritical and disgusting the social democracy is in this government, the biggest warmongering government since World War II. How they abuse this uh, talk of democracy, save democracy and so on. And uh, the best work is to see through that and the right wingers just hate them for it. So the comrades, when they went to this big demonstration, save democracy against the right, we went to these demonstrations. <laughs> They put uh, on their banners uh, against AFD, against the government, against capital. So directly attacking the government that has the social democracy in it. Which is correct. But in Spain, when Nani explained the, the character of Vox, and the right wing just tried to oust the, the, the socialist uh, prime minister Sanchez, And the state apparatus and the right wing have, uh, have this uh, Francoist path to go to demonstrations there and go like um, kick out Sanchez, kick out Vox. <laughs> that, that would be completely sectarian and, and wrong. <laughs> Similarly, in, in the US, we, we, we talked about the dangers of lesser evilism. How it's wrong to support Biden just to, against Trump. But this Sean Fein, this uh, 
uh, leader of the, the Auto Workers Union, the new one, who has uh, brought forward some good practical steps for the workers that will help them gain some experiences. He supports Biden. And we criticize this. We say this is wrong. But also we would not say, down with Sean Fein, this is like, uh, this is uh, the end, like he's a traitor now. So um, what I'm trying to say with all this, we have a deep, deep crisis. The general tendencies are the same everywhere. Uh, and we can see them and have to understand them. Um, we have to have a class uh, position when we uh, fight against the right and the whole system. We have, we, we, we have a line of demarcation of, of working together with the uh, liberals and other parts of the bourgeoisie. But this is only the beginning of uh, thinking, you know. We all have to think. <laughs> um, what does it mean for the tactic in each section, in each country? <clears throat> Trotsky had this analogy in the 30s, uh, where he said, like, in, a, in a, this situation of sharp turns, the, the workers' party, the, the party, is like uh, driving a car up, upside a hill in, with very uh, uh, like strong uh, curves, left and right turns. And you have to know which gear to put in in order to get up the hill. <laughs> if you don't, you, you, you just either roll back or like right off the cliff. So, <clears throat> with this perspective, we, we know we have a period of, of class struggle coming in before us. Of, of weak governments, not strong ones. And we need to get prepared to intervene in this process, to intervene, to, 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 to win over the best workers and youth with the correct tactics and work we do. Based on a deep uh, Marxist analysis of the object situation. And, then, and this will uh, uh, ensure that we can uh, go with all the turns uh, towards, towards a revolution, a successful revolution.